thrilled to have with us um, Ken Fishon. And Ken, I, I don't even know where to start to describe Ken's career, um, but he is uh, the former director of the Sonoma County uh, Chamber of Commerce. And out there, you may not know this, but wine country, right, California, it has over 800 wineries, right? Yeah. And so it was, when he began that, he was there for 12 years in that post, and when he began that, he says, I'm going to every winery. I'm going to visit every single winery in the county. So that was his goal, and he accomplished that goal. And he's still standing <laughs> all that time, right? Um, yeah. And uh, he's, he also is a, a senior uh, business development strategist, and he's president of the Fishon Group. And you can look at his card, and it's an extensive array of background and consulting work and all sorts of things. And we're really excited to announce today, publicly, that Ken will be joining us here at the Gilmore Car Museum. And he's going to be the Director for Programming and Hospitality, effective <coughs> March 8th, 9th, March 9th. So congratulations. <laughs> and he's going to be our go-to guy for all our, all our big shows and overseeing our hospitality. And that's going to be great. And we're, we really are excited about having Ken with us. But anyway, he's here to talk to us today about his lifelong adventure with wine. And then afterwards, we're all set up for a wine tasting in back. So afterwards, we'll come and we'll taste some of the wines that Ken and I picked out yesterday. We went shopping at Myers and had a good time picking out wines. We haven't started drinking it yet, but we will in a minute. They're all California. They're all Sonoma. Yeah, they're all Sonoma. So. Anyway, please help me welcome Ken Fisher. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, it's exciting to I, I should probably clarify, it took me four and a half years to visit every single winery in Sonoma County. And I would say four and a half years and a whole lot of spitting. <laughs> because you do learn, uh, I've also been a judge of wine competitions as well, and you do learn that you cannot swallow everything no matter how good it tastes. So, uh, today we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit of a little bit of history behind wine, uh, and maybe cover some basic things on it. We're not going to get into specifics in terms of how to read a label and specifics to tasting. And as Fred mentioned, we're going to have a fun tasting afterwards. I brought what I call some wine toys with me that I'll share with you afterwards, and, and then we're going to wrap it up after this uh, because I just returned from Sonoma County and uh, we're going to be uh, talking about how cars and wine really go to work together in a very fun and responsible way. And so we're going to take on a little tour of the Francis Ford Coppola Winery and uh, the Tucker uh, exhibit that, that Francis did. So I always have to have my top ten list and uh, there's a couple people in the front row who remember when I was here at the Kalamazoo Regional uh, Chamber of Commerce and discovered Kalamazoo. And uh, I was a big one for top 10 lists. And I moved to California to Michigan. And I had my top 10 reasons why Michigan is better than California. And one of them was a uh, true story. This has to do with cars. I was driving my car. I had owned it for a year and a half. I lived in Palm Springs. I was driving in Los Angeles. And it started to rain. I had to pull off the freeway because I had no idea how to turn on the windshield wipers. <laughs> so one of the reasons why Michigan is better than California is because you get to use your windshield wipers on a regular basis. So if we kind of put that over to the top 10, 10 wine things, um, we're going to come briefly cover the history of wine, types of wine, uh, ABAs, American Viticulture Areas, and where wine is grown in and mid-vintage, uh, and vendors and growers, and, and what their role is. Um, the right glass makes such a difference, and we're going to talk about that, and how you can take a wine and it will taste completely differently if you don't have the right glass. And then, how do you tell a good wine? Um, and then we're also going to spend a little time talking about wine, the size of the bottle, um, and the different types of bottles, and why that will make that wine even more enjoyable for you as well. And then, of course, wine and food pairings. Um, that is something that 
any wine country, whether you're in California or you're in Southwest Michigan or Northern Michigan um, or any European wine country, um, wine experience is such an important part of how we enjoy life and enjoy food. Um, and then we'll close with some fun tasting ideas for your next party and do a little quick tour of uh, some wineries in Sonoma County. Sound good? Okay, great. Well, let's go. Um, the history of wine, and you, you may not know this, but it goes back as far as 7,000 BC in China. Um, and also, <clears throat> as well, back to 6,000 BC in Georgia, the country of Georgia. And when I was in Sonoma, we did a special partnership with Georgia where um, they came over to learn about our wine country, we went over to learn about theirs. And just amazing when you think about a des wine destination that's been making it wine since 6,000 BC. Iran started back in about 5,000 BC in Sicily and 4,000 BC. So there really is quite a lot of history when you look at, at uh, wine as, as something that we continue to enjoy today. Um, the four basic types of wine I think everybody probably knows this already. Uh, white, red, sparkling wines, and champagne, and rosé. Now, the most popular white varietals, and this is, uh, you know, the, the most uh, the most that are made of these varietals, Chardonnay, Riesling, Pinot Grigio, Chenin Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, and Moscato. And so those are the most popular white wines not only in this country, but around the world. Um, for red, of course, Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, Pinot Noir, we're going to talk a little bit more about Pinot Noir later because it's such a, a unique grape. Merlot, Malbec, Zinfandel. Now, has anybody been to Italy and had Primitivo? Primitivo is the same darn thing as Zinfandel. That's what it's called in Italy, same varietal. And then has anybody been to Australia, New Zealand, and had Shiraz? Yes, I see. What, two hands, three hands. Did, did, did you know that, uh, that that is the same thing as Shiraz? It's just called that in different countries. Now, sparkling wines and champagne. Who likes sparkling wines? Okay, this is a can of original. I see Cheryl raising her hand. A can of original toast. The next time you raise a glass of sparkling wines, you say, more bubbles, less troubles, right? <laughs> um, sparkling wine happened quite by accident. It was the monk Dom Perignon who had tasted wines that were aging and they had fermented and that's what caused the, the, the bubbling. And he drank it and it hit his tongue. And do you know what Dom Perignon said? He said, I'm drinking stars. I'm drinking stars. So if you think about how exciting and celebratory um, that is that we use for sparkling wine and champagne. Now, does anybody know what grapes are used most commonly to make champagne or sparkling wine? Nope. Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Those are the two grapes. So Chardonnay and Pinot Noir are used to do to make uh, sparkling or champagne. Now, the French as we know, we'll touch briefly on the great Paris tasting that we, uh, later on when we talk about fun tasting ideas you can do in your own house. Um, but what they did is they decided uh, back in the 1940s that you could not call sparkling wine champagne unless it came from the Champagne region of France. Now here's a fun little fact for you to impress your friends with. The next time you go to the store, because you can go to Myers right here in Kalamazoo, and you can find Corbel Champagne. Well, the Corbel Brothers started in the 1850s in Sonoma County in the Russian River Valley making sparkling wine. And they call it champagne. They're the only ones that are allowed to call it champagne. Everything else has been called sparkling wine. And then the last one on here is rosé. Now, what is rosé? Do you know what gives wine its color? It's the skin. So it's how long the skins are left when, the, when they bring the grapes in and they put them in what we call the leaves in the big barrel. It's how long they leave the skin in there to make that, give it that, that beautiful color. 
Sometimes it's a light purple, sometimes it's kind of a coppery color. Um, but the Pinot Noir grape. But a great story about rosé, and there might be a few people in this room that are that will remember this. Um, there was a very famous winemaker called August Sebastiani. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Sebastiani wines. And August watched in the 1960s a whole generation of kids, young kids in the 60s, that were moving away from wine to beer and spirits. And he saw this as a real problem for his industry. And so what he did is he came up with an idea of how he could make a rosé wine out of Zinfandel because he had a lot of Zinfandel grapes and he wasn't able to sell the Zinfandel grapes. So he came up and he called it Eye of the Swan or Eye of the Partridge. And what did it become commonly known as? White Zinfandel. And White Zinfandel, August Sebastiani, literally is responsible for turning a whole generation of beer and spirit drinkers back onto wine in the 1960s. Now, if I had more time, I could tell you some stories. August, you know how sometimes when you see people it could be here in Michigan, and uh, they've got the rattiest old pickup truck, and they've got the bib overalls on that they uh, that are all torn and messed up. And that's probably the wealthiest man in, in that area. Well, that was August Sebastiani. And he was, he was quite a character and, and just a really neat man and, and really did do some great things. And, and Sebastiani is still around today. So um, if, if anybody has any, any questions as we're going through, very informal, um, just let me know. So that kind of gives you an overview on the, the types of wine and the most popular varieties. Yes, Tom. Chianti is not as popular uh, in, in terms of the world view. But yes, Chianti is a great, it's an Italian, obviously an Italian bridal. And I will tell you, one of my best experiences, I think everybody, I've always been a food and beverage nut. Um, I've always worked in food and beverage. And when I went out to Long Beach to open the Hyatt Regency, a girlfriend of mine was dating a gentleman who's a little older than her. And so he took us out to Valentino's restaurant in Pico. And I had that once in a lifetime experience with a wine that I just could not believe how phenomenal it was. And it was a Chianti. And it was just, so I would say that really, and I think everybody has a moment when they really eat something they really like or they drink something they really enjoy. Um, so, but Chianti is, very popular within, within Italy, obviously, but not as popular in the world stage or certainly here in the United States. But there are, once again, these are the main varietals, but there are hundreds, literally hundreds of varietals. So we'll talk a little bit later about some lesser known ones, because you shouldn't be afraid to try them. So, let me make sure we're... Oh, battery's running low, right? experiences that you have had have led up to be the person that you are. So I think one of the big fallacies that, that has happened with people that enjoy wine is you listen to some onophile, which is a wine enthusiast or expert, or a sommelier, you know, the snooty sommeliers, and, and they try to tell you what you think that you should like. You know? I mean, you like, you know, you like wines from Tobacco, right? Some other two pop yeah. as well. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, no one should tell you not to. And, and so this is this is kind of the, the new way of looking at wine, and, and is to not let someone try to tell you what that you should like. 
You like what you like in terms of foods that you eat and the wines that you drink, and, and you know that because you know yourself. And that's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And you should be, uh, if you go to a winery and that winery is trying to tell you, you know, that you're all these different flavors and things you're supposed to taste and you don't taste them, don't worry about it. But if you like it, enjoy it. Hi, Kim. Hi, Susie. Uh, so, number two, American viticulture areas, and uh, we're sitting in a wonderful area here in southwest Michigan uh, for winemaking because of the lake effect weather. That lake that acts like a giant refrigerator in the summer and a giant heater in the winter and keeps, gives us a longer agricultural growing season. Same is true of the Pacific Ocean um, in California on both northern and southern. Uh, where Temecula is located. Um, but the wine region says an awful lot about the type of varietals that grow well there. Um, we mentioned earlier, Pinot Noir is the most finicky, most difficult grape to grow. When it's done right, it's delicious. But the problem is it has, you know, just like people, some people are very thick-skinned, some people are very thin-skinned. Pinot Noir is very thin-skinned and finicky, and it does not like heat. It likes cool, foggy mornings, and, and it likes warm days, not hot days. And so Pinot Noir is really, really good in the Northwest U.S. too. Um, there's some other varietals that grow here that won't grow very well there. So um, but the whole idea of knowing what makes a good wine, it starts with the dirt and the environment. And we call them grape growers, and, but they're really the farmers that grow the grapes that make, make the wine. And the key things that the grape grower looks at, um, soil, very, very important. Um, if you, have, have any of you had Chalk Hill wines? Uh, that's Chalk Hill, very, a lot of limestone growing on this mountain where uh, the vineyard is, it gives it a very different and really wonderful taste for particularly their Chardonnays. Um, weather, very important. We had some, uh, we had a really cold winter a few years ago, right? And uh, we didn't have peaches this year. And because they just was too cold here, there wasn't enough snow to cover and insulate some of the plants. So weather is important. <clears throat> the other thing you will see, you'll see the Sonoma County Sustainable sign there. Um, when I was in Sonoma County, uh, at Sonoma, the Sonoma County Tourism, we partnered with and we were office together with the Sonoma County Vintners, the Sonoma County Wine Growers. And I used to say, it's <coughs> the farmers that grow the grapes, the vintners that make the wine, and then we're the ones that bring in everybody to buy and drink. And so we partnered together, and this was our brand that we came up with. But then we also realized one of the things we could do to set ourselves apart was to be a leader in sustainability. And a lot of times some people say, well, I drink wine and it gives me a headache. Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why that could happen. Um, a lot of pesticides were used in vineyards as well. So there's the two types of farming for sustainability. You have organic farming, which people are familiar with, because we have a whole organic vegetable section at our grocery store. And then we also have, um, biodynamic farming, which takes the, the moon, the tides, and everything all together. And part of having a sustainable farming process, either organic or biodynamic, is you're not using pesticides. Instead, what you do is you have what's known as an insectary in your vineyard. You plant plants that are going to attract the insects, that, the good insects that eat the bad insects that will harm your crop. Another thing, have you ever gone into a vineyard, uh, any place, and you see roses planted at the end? Do you know what the roses are there for? It's like the canary in the coal mine. If the canary died in the coal mine, you get the heck out of there, the air's bad. Well, if the roses start to die, it means the insects are attacking the roses and are going to get the grapes next. So that's just a kind of a high sign that a vintner or wine grower will plant. We, we all think of Beautiful roses at the end of this vineyard. No, they're there for a reason. So, no, they won't be using it. Also, have things like owl houses. 
and they also raise hawks, um, they'll do things like you'll see the little tinsel that blows in the wind and scares the birds away. Or you'll, they'll even have, if they're vineyards that aren't near homes, they'll have cannons that go off periodically to scare the birds and, and, and the critters away. So but there's a lot of things that they do so that you don't get that headache from that wine. You don't have um, those sulfites that exist in so many different wines because it is organically or sustainably farmed. So very important uh, role that the grape growers play. Um, vendors obviously pick up the ball that the grape growers hand to them, and they are the ones that are actually taking the grapes, they're harvesting the, they're harvesting the grapes, they're bringing it into the winery, they're putting it into the fermenting vats or into the barrels, depending on the variety. And so they play a really critical role too. But part of the thing that I think is important for people to understand is how expensive this process is. <clears throat> if you're starting a vineyard, you plant the vineyard, it takes four years before you have any fruit. Four years. If it's white wine, it's another year, year and a half until you have a product you can sell. Because it has to age, if it ages in barrels, or if it's stainless steel, or whatever. Now if it's red, well, you know, it's probably two to three years. So you've got a at least six to seven year revenue flow problem. And when you're in an area like the Pacific Northwest, it costs about $40,000 per acre per year to maintain that vineyard and to do all those sustainable practices we just talked about. So that's a whole lot of money. So an option that vendors came up with to get some early cash flow called barrel tasting. So in March, which is coming up, this is the first of March, this is barrel tasting time. And what happens is, if you think about the stock market and how you're banking on futures, think about banking on wine futures. And you get to go to the winery and they open up the barrel and they'll give you a taste of the barrel that you can try today. And if you like that, now it's not done yet, it was just harvested last summer, um, but it's been sitting there and it's starting to you know, become what it's going to be, but it's not quite there yet. Uh, it might be another six to months, sometimes up to a year before, depending on the variety, before it's bottled. But what you can do right then and there, if you like it, you can buy it at a discount. And then when it's ready to be bottled, the vendor will, will let you know, come and pick up your wine or I can ship it to you. So it's one of the ways that vintners have been able to stay afloat. And when you have 800 vintners in one destination, they got to do everything possible to be able to keep that cash flow going. So this is a, uh, one of the saying that I've often said, you know, if you want to make a small fortune in the wine business, you better darn well start with a big one. Uh, and we have some people like Francis Ford Coppola, uh, my friend Tom Klein, who uh, he and his family uh, also uh, uh, are really amazing people, the Sebastiani family, uh, the McMurray family, you'll, you'll see a picture of Kate McMurray in a little bit. So these are all people that started with a great big fortune, and, and some of them continue to make it because they've got the volume there like uh, Francis does. So, uh, Closer. Okay. Now, very important to remember. Number four, wine is a living thing. People don't think of wine as being alive. It's a living thing. So aging and cellaring really, really matters. If you, have any of you been to a restaurant, I'll, I'll use Mexico as an example, because Mexico is notorious for not storing wine properly. Um, you know, wine should be stored in a cool, dark, place. It should be any, really the ideal temperature for storing wine is between about 50 and about 52 and 65. Uh, so, you know, when you see, it always gets me when you see on these home remodel shows uh, where they're building a big wine rack and it's just sitting in a room. I'm like, okay, they're, 
they're going to have issues and problems. But have you ever had a wine and it, if it's not been stored properly? And it's usually the phrase is it's burnt. And it will, and when you know how to recognize a good wine, we're going to talk about how you would see that or know that. But I see Cheryl, you're shaking your head, so you've, you've had some, bit, some wine that was not, and it's all about the storage. So really important to store in a cool, dark place. If you have, you know, basements here are awesome for that. So, um, you know, a lot of people have wine refrigerators or uh, different storage things, and I've got some information up here later on where some kind of wine toys we'll talk about too. Uh, the second part to this is the glass really matters. And I say this because if you think back to the everyday Italian wines like the Chiantis, um, they were in like almost a small water glass. Well, they weren't really great wines, and they were everyday wines. But there's a, a gentleman named Maximilian Riedel, and Riedel glasses are some of the best crystal glasses that you can get. And what he does is he'll get everybody together, and he will pour the same wine into like a non-crystal glass, uh, a water glass, uh, like um, Arco Rock was a famous type of glass that, that would never break. It's almost like a windshield of a car, unless it was a Tesla. Uh, and a truck, right? Uh, anyway, so, and, and <laughs> the types of glasses, now, if you're, if you're really into this, uh, you know, now remember, I'm not a wine snob, but I, I want the wine to taste well. So this is my carrying case, and it has all the different glasses in it. And this is a what we call a Pinot Noir glass. It has the big bowl at the bottom, and it's absolutely perfect for Pinot Noir because it's such a delicate wine. You're going to pour, pour it in, and you never fill the glass. You're going to do if you do a typical pour, it's about five ounces, and which would bring it up to about there. So the glass is barely a third full. And then you're going to swirl it around. We're going to talk about that too. This glass allows for that. Um, so that's the Pinot Noir glass. <laughs> now, if you're into red wines, <laughs> this is a typical red wine glass. So it's called Burgundy glass, and it's and once again always recommend crystal because crystal really makes such a big difference. Um, but this is a fairly it's a larger glass. It doesn't have a big bowl like the Pinot Noir glass, and these will all be up here later if you can't really see them, we'll you can come up and check them out afterwards. And then, this would be your white wine glass. So this would be what you would have Sauvignon Blanc, or, or a nice Chardonnay, or a Moscato, or in that. And this is a little smaller than the Burgundy, about the same size, shape, and all of that. So um, this is really the ideal glass, and it will really change how the wine tastes. Uh, another thing that has been popular in recent years are the stemless glasses. And these are great, especially if you're, and they even make a, a stemless glass that you can take by your pool or out on your boat, that even though it's plastic, it's not going to break. Um, it really does a nice job of imitating a uh, good glass. Uh, but very important to look at these things and, and to, to have that right glass. <clears throat> Oops. Okay, this is uh, me in college at age 18. I just want you to notice happy face, drinking Cabernet Sauvignon in the right glass, even at age 18. It makes a difference. Uh, I was legal, believe it or not, yes, because I was drinking age was 18. They raised me to 19 when I turned 19, and then uh, when I, and then they raised it to when I was 20 to 21, but I've been doing it for a while and I'm still able to get away with it. But uh, anyway, so still I just wanted to show that you know even as a teenager I was using the right glass, so <laughs> and, and, and enjoying it. <laughs> how how can you tell a good wine? These are the basic things that you can do to tell a good wine. You're going to look at in that glass and. You know, and sometimes it should have a pleasant color, 
You're going to swirl it around like we talked about in the Pinot Noir glass, and you're going to...